the economic reforms you like the new government to focus on? And do you think the current crop of politicians have got the appetite for the kind of reform necessary? And you, you mentioned part of partisanship, obviously more bipartisanship in Parliament. Yeah. Um, well, we probably both should answer that, but uh, uh, I think the most important first step is for Australians to, and the political leaders to recognise we've got a very big problem. Uh, uh, this isn't the challenge we face can't be solved by small incremental adjustments. There's lots of changes that are necessary right across the board. Uh, and I put at the centre the securing of the reduction in the exchange rate and, to, and making that into a real reduction, uh, an improvement in competitiveness. But that's not going to be possible without lots of other changes, uh, supporting productivity raising reforms and the, the changes in political culture that, that I've mentioned. So the starting place, in my view, uh, is an Australian discussion of the serious uh, to the point where nakedly uh, self-interested pressures for uh, policy change uh, aren't taken seriously. They've been taken seriously and they've been influential uh, in, in recent times. And I don't think we're going to get a new reform era if that uh, is, is the basis of continuing policy discussion. What about, no, what about policy um, discussions that are had just basically because it's um, nakedly in the interest of one side of politics? to attack whatever the other side is doing without really having an alternative policy? Same deal. Um, uh, although I do uh, mention in one section of the book that uh, uh, th there's a helpful myth about bipartisanship in the reforms of the 80s and 90s. Uh, that there, was, there were some issues on which there was bipartisan support and some which there weren't, and which the, the opposition later came to accept the, uh, the, the wisdom of the policy. So it's an unrealistic idea that imagine there's going to be partisanship on everything. Uh, but if uh, opposition is just in a knee-jerk way uh, opposing everything the, the government put forward, uh, then uh, uh, we're not going to get ourselves out of this hole. But is it true to say that the difference uh, in terms of the interest groups between, say, the 80s and uh, more recent years is a matter of degree rather than kind? Because, for example, the unions were quite important in stymieing the setting up of the broad-based consumption tax. Uh, yes, probably a uh, uh, basis of, uh, uh, probably the difference is, is of degree. There are no absolutes, anything to do with society. But, uh, but even then, that followed a, uh, 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 a very detailed and thorough uh, uh, discussion of policy. There, there, was, there was a white paper uh, that had been made available to the community. There was a summit in which all interest groups were, uh, uh, were involved. Uh, the Business Council, uh, Matt position was actually opposed the, the package of reforms. The ACTU opposed the, the package of reforms. So uh, there was thorough discussion of the issue and everyone involved in that debate tried to make it seem that they were putting forward a case in the national interest. So even that was different from some of the recent episodes. Okay. I, let me just, uh, I want to disagree gently. Ross, shouldn't disagree too much with some of the talk just talked. But I disagree with Ross gently and then add a qualification. But I, I agree, Michelle, I think interest groups, not, and not just unions, have always been very vocal in pushing their own barrow. And Ross, it's, it's a bit before both of our times, but if you think of the campaign, the, the banks waged against bank nationalisation uh, up in the uh, you know, post-war, the two post-war Labor government, tried to undertake. That was a massive uh, political campaign, coupled with a, a legal campaign as well that was ultimately successful and, and I think in large measure contributed to Robert Menzies' victory in 1949. So, so the, 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 you know, we're a democracy. Everyone's, everyone's entitled to pick up a megaphone and obviously if you've got lots of uh, resources, whether you're a trade union or a big business, uh, you can afford a pretty big one. I would say this, uh, and this is the qualification. The reason the miners' campaign against the mining tax was so successful was twofold. Firstly, it, the RSPT was an absurd, absurdly designed proposal. Now, let's not forget what it was. The proposition was as follows. On the basis that the Commonwealth would accept a put to it 
of 40% of the losses of any project. That is to say, at the end of the project, it had lost you know, a billion dollars, $400 million of that could, would be refunded by the Commonwealth. On that basis, it was assumed. Therefore, the cost of that project at the outset, as to 40%, would be no more than the long-term com Commonwealth Government bond rate. Now, that, I, I'm prepared to accept that that could, could have been regarded as being theoretically elegant somewhere, you know, in a back office in the Treasury or whatever. But it was so completely defied uh, any market experience or commercial reality. Uh, it was never going to fly. And added to that, the Treasurer uh, didn't appear to understand it very well and wasn't a particularly good advocate. I mean, one of the things governments need to be, politicians need to be, if they are going to take on opponents, whether they're unions or business or, or anybody, they've got to be able to, under, they've got to understand their case, understand the policy they're presenting and be able compellingly to make the case. So, you know, it, 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 I think in many respects the effectiveness of that mining uh, industry campaign was based was, was because one, the policy proposal was, was a very was unworkable. Uh, and of course this is why Ross and I both agree that if, if that Henry report had been exposed to the light of day at the end of 2009, Swan had just said, okay, here it is, I'm off to the beach, I suggest you go to, let's, you know, we'll we'll you know, come to some conclusions when we come back that you know, on Australia Day. If he said that, it would have been torn to shreds and maybe some other good ideas could have emerged. Uh, but the other, so it's not just, it's, it was the policy was poor and also the advocacy was really poor. I mean, never forget, you know, you talk about uh, businesses buying some spots on television. If you are the Prime Minister or the Treasurer of this country, you can be on 7.30 report, and every, every radio station, every television network, pay, free to wear, just about whenever you like. You have a massive megaphone. You have access to, in effect, tens of millions of free media simply because of your position. And if you cannot make your case, uh, that's your fault. That is your problem. And I think that was the big part of the, the issue there with the miners. Professor Gallery, is it a retrograde step to repeal the carbon tax? And Mr Turnbull, your attendance at this full launch, does that send any signal about your government, what you think of the government's approach in tackling climate change, well, given Ross Garner is so critical with implementing Well, I don't agree with everything in Ross's book. Um, and uh, and I, what, what, do you think I'd only go to, what a dreadful country it would be if you only wanted books to be published, only supported, only welcome books that were published that agreed with everything you agreed with or everything the government agreed with, heaven's sake. Look, I welcome public debate on these issues, and, and Ross has got a very long-standing position on climate change, which is not consistent, entirely consistent with that of the government, but uh, Ross refers to, and I thought it was rather a neat reference, I think you might have been thinking of someone, Ross refers in one part of the book to the effectiveness of the muscular direct action of American government. So what were you were thinking of there? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly wasn't the flimsy Minister for Communication trying to be one of my athletic colleagues. But the, uh, but, uh, but no, so, so the, the, uh, I, I, the, the book, I mean, I, I don't know if you've read it or not, but the, but the book is uh, Ross's, well, you know, Ross speaks for himself, but he's, he's strongly in favour of a marketplace mechanism to cut, cut emissions, and that's, that is not the government's policy, and I'm a, you know, our policy is direct action, muscular or otherwise, and as a cabinet minister, I support it. And uh, on, on the other part of your question, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I don't expect uh, Malcolm has been kind enough to read very carefully and comment on the book to uh, endorse every uh, word in it, uh, but I do think it would be a retrograde step to uh, re repeal the carbon uh, package. Amongst other things, it makes the budget challenge much harder. Uh, just a few nights ago on uh, Late Line, uh, a chap from Frontier Economics uh, who presented himself as being advisor to the government, I don't know what the actual position is, explained that uh, direct action can actually meet its budget objectives, uh, but it will require a huge, many, many billions of dollars expenditures outside the forward estimates in years five and six. Uh, now, I, I can believe that direct action can meet the, the uh, carbon reduction targets if you spent 
spent huge amounts of money in years five and six. In addition to those many billions of dollars per annum of extra expenditure outside the forward estimates, as the Frontier Economics Advisor uh, uh, indicated would be necessary, in addition to that, you lose a big hunk of revenue uh, and an increasing amount of revenue over time. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the current legislation provides for a linkage to Europe uh, in the middle of 2015-16, which will lead to a substantial uh, reduction in policy from what various parties have said. If the government wanted to bring that forward by a year, it would have the support of the Senate, the current Senate. Uh, that would bring down that big reduction in price to the middle of uh, next year. Um, uh, but European prices won't stay so low forever. Uh, one day there will be an economic recovery in, in Europe. One day there will be... Uh, uh, high prices, and so the, the revenue loss, uh, which has already been compensated in tax cuts and, uh, uh, and social security increases and, and payments to uh, adjustment payments to uh, 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 users of, uh, of coal and power generation, uh, uh, will add to the, the budget deficit. So the, the long term budget costs of the change uh, will be will very substantially increase the burden. Of, uh, of, of adjustment to the budget beyond year four, and unfortunately, we'll, we'll make that question of uh, limits on debt uh, very much more difficult. Professor, how feasible are the expectations that the, 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 the huge and growing middle class in our near region is going to want Australian goods and services so badly that they'll be at least partial replacement for the? Uh, the ebbing uh, resources uh, revenue. Is, is that feasible expectation? Generally, yes. The sort of perspective on that that was set out in the Asian Century well, paper is broadly right. Uh, I've got uh, uh, more confidence of early delivery on that in China than in the other big Asian countries, but, uh, but I have confidence that India is on a strong growth path that will uh, support the, uh, the, the big expansion of consumption in the middle class. We've got bigger confidence that Indonesia uh, is on that path. So yes, but the difference between uh, the opportunity that's created by uh, the, the new consumption of services, of high value foodstuffs, of specialised manufacturers, the difference between that growth in demand in the period ahead and the resources demand in the past dozen years is that uh, we don't have any special advantages. If, if the demand is for iron ore, we've got big, high quality uh, iron ore deposits sitting in the Pilbara that we can develop uh, uh, with all of our disabilities, we can develop more cheaply than, uh, th than other people can develop uh, iron ore deposits. But if you're competing for education services, you've got to be competitive with the United States and Britain. Uh, if you're competing for, with, for uh, business services, you've got to be competitive basically with all of the uh, other developed countries in Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, if you're competing for high quality foodstuffs, processed foodstuffs, and the growth in demand in China is colossal, uh, will be colossal in the period of those but we're competing with New Zealand, with Canada, the, the United States, uh, uh, even, even Europe. Uh, so uh, uh, competitiveness becomes uh, crucial in these things and that huge appreciation of the real exchange rate over the past uh, 10 years uh, has made us uncompetitive. So uh, to, to get to make use of those markets uh, we've got to address the reform issues and the real exchange rate issues that are the centre of this book. Can I just make one, but I broadly, broadly agree with that, but just make one comment um, and it relates to the question you asked earlier about uh, uh, carbon. Competitiveness, competitiveness is clearly the key. As Ross says, you know, we have a comparative advantage in iron ore and metallurgical coal and, and in large measure to LNG. Uh, so, so that's, that's you know, we can't be complacent about that, but there, broadly speaking that's true. Uh, we don't have a comparative advantage in agriculture. Uh, we don't have a comparative advantage in manufacturing, obviously, and, you know, or indeed in business services, uh, or indeed in education, uh, because there are plenty of other opportunities. We are not the lowest. We are not at the low end, low 
low end of the cost curve on providing any of those things. So competitive, competitiveness is absolutely critical. Now, in terms of agriculture, uh, one of the, I know Ross has reservations about the direct action policy, but one of its virtues is that apart from replacing a scheme which does put, does add to the cost of energy and add to the cost of agricultural production, it also, by focusing on uh, carbon offsets, if you like, derived from the land, land management sector, uh, soil carbon, you know, agricultural uh, planting trees and so forth, to be part of Greenhouse policy, that actually provides support to agriculture. So that's, you know, whatever, and again, we don't have a debate about climate policy, I think, heavens on, the communications minister, not the environment minister, there are some, some um, great advantages in that, but, uh, but nonetheless, that is, there's no doubt that our policy uh, will be relatively advantageous to agriculture compared to the policy that it's replacing. Ross, you talked about um, yeah. uh, core and non-core promises in the book and how it's the line from Howard and how there is a need to break promises sometimes yeah. if it means you know getting rid of bad policy. Um, obviously you'd love Abbott to break the uh, direct action promise. Um, is there anything else that you would like to see him drop out of uh, the election platform? Well, let's step back a bit. Um, circumstances change on any government. Uh, and in the end, the quality of a government depends more than anything else on how it adjusts to circumstances as they evolve. I think it's reasonable to, to say that uh, we hadn't had the community discussion that alerted uh, our leaders uh, to the seriousness of our economic problem uh, before, the, before the last election. So a lot of the premises of uh, policy as it was developed uh, uh, were, were premises that uh, have been changed, that are changed by realistic assessment of the difficulties of the problems that we uh, face. Now, in my view, uh, if you're going to successfully lead a country through hard times, you, you have to recognise that if the world changes, uh, you need to change your mind. Now, uh, uh, obviously, uh, a, a leader has to keep faith with the electorate, and that will require explaining uh, the, the new context, explaining the difficulties of the situation that we face, uh, explaining that what, what a government, what a leader would have liked to have delivered is no longer feasible or would cause other problems if, 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 if an attempt was made. And therefore, consistently with the values that the uh, leader appealed to the community on, it is necessary to modify some, some policies. I drew a contrast in the book between the Whitlam and Holt governments in this respect. Whitlam was deeply committed to his program, to implementing everything that he promised. And it, it uh, it, it drove Australia into a very difficult uh, economic set, uh, set of problems. Uh, uh, now, Whitlam could not reasonably have been expected to anticipate uh, the oil crisis, the recession in the United States and Europe, the end of high growth in Japan. But once those things be, uh, uh, came on the horizon, a wise uh, 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 Whitlam government would have said, OK, I know we promised all these things, and they're all good things, uh, but we're going to have to modify uh, the, those problems. We're going to have to set priorities, do some things, not do others. And this is why we're, we're not doing, doing things. Well, Hawke had the huge advantage of, of observing that Whitlam experience. So when he came to uh, office, and these were days before the Charter of Budget Honesty, it couldn't happen today because now the, the uh, one uh, very important reform of the early Howard government uh, under Costello as treasurer, uh, a, a government is now required to let the Treasury and the Department of Finance uh, put forward forward estimates during a, uh, that are its own responsibility during an election campaign. They weren't in place in 83. So the first briefing that uh, Hawke got from the Treasury was that there was going to be a deficit of 4.6% of uh, GDP, uh, which was a complete shock right out of the blue. Uh, and 
Uh, Hawke's response to that was to say, OK, circumstances have changed. Uh, I'm going to bring down a mini-budget in May that implements as many things as we can responsibly implement. And that will include our, uh, uh, some things that, that cost money, like uh, provision for Medicare, but it means we won't be able to do everything. And uh, uh, that's the situation we're in now. We, we face a very big challenge, every bit as big as uh, Hawke faced in '83 in some ways bigger, uh, and uh, we, we have to recognise that, uh, uh, th that it is not uh, 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 an irresponsible uh, uh, leader who uh, comes clean with the electorate, uh, notes that circumstances have changed, and therefore not every element of policy can be delivered as promised.